Jesus uses the words forgive, forgiven, and forgiveness 43 times in the gospel records. It is a major part of his teachings. And it is the benefit that we also today have from his sacrifice, forgiveness of our sins. In our second session, we will discuss how forgiveness is the second key principle to effective interpersonal relations. Hello, my name is Dave Jennings, and I'm pleased to share with you interpersonal relations, and specifically in this session, how forgiveness is required for the resolution of conflict. When we think about the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, we see the standard of forgiveness. It's demonstrated by Jesus on the cross. While unjustly suffering, he declared in that painful time, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Of all the wrongs that have ever been done to us, none of them can compare with this crime that was done toward Jesus. Far too often we find ourselves in situations where we are no longer talking. We feel that we were wronged and the other person doesn't agree with us or they don't offer any remorse and they don't ask for forgiveness. Communication stops and the relationship begins to decay And every behavior begins to be filtered through the strain of that declining relationship. Both parties find it impossible to be able to move forward because you see pride is bruised and it's crushed and we seek some kind of revenge because of that. The writer, uh, C.S. Lewis, a British writer and a lay theologian, he wrote this incredible uh, passage, this little uh, quote, which I'm going to share here. It says, we all agree that forgiveness is a beautiful idea until we have to practice it. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. How do we actually practice forgiveness? You see, when we find ourselves in a situation of conflict, And when people aren't talking anymore and there is not forgiveness, what tends to happen is we find ourselves like we're in some kind of deep pit and we can't get out of that pit. You can't climb out of it. Isabel Holland wrote this, as long as you don't forgive, who and whatever it is will occupy rent-free space in your mind. Boy, isn't that true? When we're having conflict with somebody, that's in our head. When we see them, when we think about them, when we think we might be seeing them, it's something that paralyzes us. Do you think that's the way walking with Jesus is supposed to be? You see, we're told in Mark chapter 11 that we need to start the resolution of any kind of conflict by forgiveness. In Mark chapter 11, Jesus says this, and whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, forgive, so that your Father who is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. And this is pretty clear instruction by Jesus, isn't it? If you're praying to be forgiven, you have to start by forgiving those who have wronged you. And that makes sense, doesn't it? We ask God to forgive this insurmountable debt, this terrible amount of wrong that we have done. So we too must forgive often the small things that have been done to us. And this is familiar to us because remember, in the Lord's Prayer, which maybe you learned at an early age, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. You see, 
in order for me to be forgiven of my sins, the expectation is that I must first forgive those who have sinned against me. In the Bible, and particularly in the New Testament, there are two types of forgiveness that are discussed. One type is where you haven't really had reconciliation. The person hasn't apologized, they haven't repented, but you can still forgive, and the way you do this is by giving the matter over to God, even if it's not reconciled. We're going to talk more about that in just a moment. The second, of course, is where there has been some kind of reconciliation. The two parties have made up, they've apologized, the wrong has been made right, perhaps, and this is kind of an unconditional forgiveness that we're talking about. But the one we'd like to talk about, which is the one we can all practice, is this first type of forgiveness. It's when I give the problem over to the Lord, I turn it over to Him, I send it away. Again, that means I'm going to trust in God, doesn't it? I will choose not to hold this charge against the other person. We may be reconciled in the future, but right now what I can do is I can put this aside and I can love my brother even if we aren't reconciled yet. I can put the resolution into the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in all offenses against us, this must be the standard. What we do is we turn the problem over to the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what he said. If you're heavy laden, if you're burdened, come to me and I will bear that burden with you. It's actually something that David quite understood well. In Psalm 37, this is what David says. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. So that's not depending on us proving we're right. God will do that. Verse 7, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over what one who prospers over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. He repeats that again. It only tends to evil. For the evildoer shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. That's a wonderful principle for us to apply in our lives, to hand it over to the Lord, to wait patiently for him. So this is where it gets tough. Philippians chapter 2. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. This is tough. When I am in conflict, I need to count the other person's needs as more significant than that of my own. Put the other needs or the needs of the other first. Wow. I mean, that is really unnatural, isn't it? But as Paul says, that's exactly what Jesus himself did, choosing to suffer on the cross and to put the needs of others above his own personal needs. And so we're told to do the opposite. In Romans chapter 12, verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And this is what walking with Jesus demands of us. Jesus didn't behave selfishly. It was his obedience to God and his selflessness that overcame evil. Walking with Jesus requires us to believe that God will do what is right. And so it requires us to look at our own lives and to look at our own motives. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you seek the speck that is in your brother's eye 
but do not notice the log that's in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. You see, when we're embroiled in conflict, the natural thing is to try to justify ourselves, to line up all the arguments that prove how I'm right and you're wrong. But as we saw in class one, that's trusting in ourselves. That's trying to justify ourselves and not relying on God. We are encouraged to examine our own hearts and to judge others as we would want to be judged. And when we do this, it motivates us to show mercy and to forgive. So walking with Jesus requires us not to rely on the natural impulses to solve conflict, but begin by asking Jesus to help us with the problem, to give it over to him and forgive that person even before forgiveness is requested. Trust that Jesus will ultimately do what is right and that he knows what is right and examine your own heart and your own motives. Demonstrate love to the other person. Overcome evil by doing good. In our next class, we'll look at how the Bible provides practical guidance for good interpersonal relations. Thank you.